So uh, I'm going to go over this a little bit of the agenda today. We have a couple speakers and then hopefully our um, social workers will be on in a little bit. But uh, we do have uh, starting us off today. We our first speaker is Chow Win Lan. She is a social scientist uh, for the ESRD National Coordinating Center. She conducts research and supports clinical, technical, and analytic efforts focused on addressing health inequities and kidney disease. She is supporting CMS in identifying unmet health-related social needs that affect the ESRD community, developing strategic approaches for the use and analysis of healthcare data, and targeting interventions to meet the needs of the ESRD patients. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn over uh, the presentation to Chow. Thank you, Stephanie, and hello, everyone. So today we'll be talking about the social determinants of health that you've probably been hearing about and some strategy to address those. So next slide, please. Before we start, I thought that we would um, come using the analogy of a tree or your favorite plants. So think about what is it that it's, think about its roots and the leaves and what do the trees need to be healthy or what does your favorite plant need to be healthy? Feel free to jump into the chat um, as you think about what do the trees need? And one of the things that we could probably think about is the sun, the water, the healthy soil. So this is how we are gonna think about the social determinants of health and the impacts um, it has on variety of issues. Uh, next slide, please. So what makes us healthy? We'll be talking about the six different domains of social determinants of health, the impacts of them, and also ways to address them. Next slide, please. In the WHO, World Health Organization, it talks about the social determinants of health are the conditions where people are born, grow up, live, work, and play. That would affect a wide range of health functioning and our quality of life. That includes economic stability, the neighborhoods that build environment, the education, food, community and our social support system, and of course, the healthcare system. So we'll be diving into specific ones um, as we look into the different data and the content. Next slide. What do the social determinants of health impact? So each year in the US, 1.5 million people experience unstable housing and 3.6 million people cannot access care due to costs or lack of transportation and 40 million people face hunger and about 11.8% of the household are experiencing food insecurity. And we'll dive into that um, as we go on into this presentation. Next slide. So the first domain that we'll be looking together as the social determinants of health is healthcare system. This could include provider availability, access to linguistically and culturally appropriate care and quality of care. And of course, this is not an exhaustive list. There are uh, many other ways that healthcare system can impact um, population health and our individual health. Next slide. Access to care. So what we do know is that in the survey that was conducted, 6% of adults say that they did not go to and obtain their needed medical care due to costs. And what's more is that access to care also vary geographically and really impact how people can stay healthy. For example, for the kidney care, we know that primary care professionals or nephrologists are in shortage in certain areas. And in the rural places, dialysis facilities are less likely to offer home program compared to the facility in urban settings. So this really impacted how the people can receive care, the availability of care, and also how they will be able to receive the care that they needed at the time they needed. Next slide. So we have a poll. Uh, the first poll for this presentation is that for the patients, what are the business, biggest obstacle to accessing the care you need? And if your provider, what is the biggest obstacle that you observe in patients accessing the care they need. So feel free to 
at your responses to the poll questions. The first response is no transportation or transportation challenges. The second one is limited availability in hours or staffing. The third one is cost. And the fourth one is other. And I understand that this is um, simplifying the different categories, but we want to have a quick, um, quick response. And if you can finish the responses, can hit submit. And if we can, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, like two more people that uh, should hit the submit button so that we can close the poll. One more person. Uh, uh, all you have to do is just hit the submit and we'll be able to close the poll. Okay. So I'm gonna close the poll now and uh, WebEx is doing its thing, calculating the poll results and we should have them in the next 10 seconds or so and i will be able to show everyone um, the results all right uh so do you see the results yes june thank you so much mm -hmm. so the biggest one so far that we have is on uh, transportations and then followed by cost, limited availability um, of the provider. So thank you everyone for responding to the poll. So transportation is definitely one of the um, biggest challenges. So we will be also diving into some of the transportation challenges. And next slide, please. And one of the six domains is on food. So food, USDA defines that food security is access by all people at all times to have enough food for an active and healthy life. Next slide. So what does food insecurity mean? Food insecurity could come up when people have regularly run out of food or at least go with at least one day without eating or do not know where the next meal will be. And how prevalent is that? We know that in the U.S., close to 12% of the people in a household are experiencing food insecurity. So it is a phenomenon that people do experience and also it worsen because they are food desert. People cannot access the healthy choices they need and the for affordability of the food options. Also impacting on the food insecurity and the situation that people are in. So that is the second domain of the six social determinants of health and next slide please also we wanted to talk about neighborhoods and physical environment that include the housing the quality of house the transportation availability that we just had the poll and also the parks availability of parks and playgrounds so people can have a safe space to exercise and have physical activities next slide so how does um, how do the neighborhoods and physical environment impact our health and our community? First, um, as you have pointed out in the poll, is that transportation is a big determinant of our health. Access to care and healthcare services, not only that, but also accessing the social services. It's impacted by transportation and the transportation challenges. Also, how our health is impacted by our environmental conditions, such as unsafe air, polluted water, that could also create a health risk. And one of the components in the neighborhoods and physical environment is that housing quality, home safety and housing quality, including the presence of the mold or lead could damage our health. So these are some of the examples of how neighborhoods and physical environment can impact their health, and that is including in our social determinants of health. Next slide, please. So we're having a second poll of our presentation here is on transportation. For the patients, how do you usually get to a dialysis facility? And for the provider, in your observations, how do people, patients usually get to a dialysis facility? First one is that they drive to the facility, the patient drive to facility themselves. Second one is a caregiver brought the patient to the facility. Third one is taking public transportation. The fourth one is using paratransit services. And the fifth one is others. So we're gonna take a few seconds here. 
Yep, so uh, we have uh, six people who are, or 10 people now who are in progress of uh, completing the poll. Um, we're gonna close the poll in about another five seconds so that four more people uh, can hit that submit button um, and we can get the poll results. All right, I'm going to close the poll. And WebEx is doing its thing, calculating. Uh, so in another 10 seconds or so, we should be able to uh, show the poll results to everyone on the call. All right, two seconds. All right, and there we go. Thank you, Jerome. So we do see that the greatest categories are the people using the paratransit services, followed by the caregiver bringing the patients um, to the dialysis facility, and the small portions is driving to the facility, um, patients themselves, or using public tra transportations. In, in some of the survey that we do know is that 20% um, of, of the patients using the paratransit services, and we do know that there are issues and um, different problems and challenges associated with different transportation options. So thank you so much for responding to that. And the next domain that we'll be talking into is education. So we know that this month is the October is the health literacy month, and we know that health literacy refers to how people understand the information about health and healthcare, and also about how people can apply that information into your own life and make decisions and act upon it using the information that they have. Next slide. So what does health literacy mean for the ESRD community? Greater health literacy about clinic care can improve the patients and provider communications and we also know that in the studies and research that improve health knowledge, um, the health literacy can, greater health literacy can improve the health knowledge and also leading to greater access to care. So these are different ways that if patient can have um, improved health literacy, it could lead to better health outcomes and for the patients. Next slide, please. So another domain that we wanna look at is community and social context. And that it could include our social support. Next slide. So social support. Research has um, also been talking about that. People with greater social support live longer and healthier life. And social support doesn't have to just be in the same for everyone. A person can receive help and engage in interaction with family, friends, co-worker, healthcare professionals, or even of members of one's community or neighborhoods and peer mentors among many, many others. So there are different ways that social support can really impact a patient's health, but that can come in different forms and for uh, different people in different situations. Next slide. So we've looked at the different domains of social determinants of health. So in these three different circles, what we are looking at is individual persons who have different social needs, that including food, um, healthcare, um, social support, and also on the community level, we have different social determinants of health. Uh, so you look at the availability of healthcare system, transportation, and the infrastructure environment of the housing. And on the bigger level, we have systemic causes that will impact our community and our, our health. Next slide, please. So we conducted interview with different as facilities on addressing social determinants of health. And here are some of the few ways that patients can do or the dialysis or the providers can do in order to help address the social determinants of health. The first one is communications. If patient would like, we can utilize the language line services and look, patient can look at the specials newsletter where it has community resources. And if patient would like to, they can also bring family members or friend 
to improve their communications, and of course, can also speak to patient navigators. And on the educational material side, patient can communicate the learning style, and provider can actually ask the patients what is the preferred learning style. Is it video, audio, pictures? And also asking about or communicate the preferred language. And on community-based resources, we also know that patient can connect with the social workers or public library or their faith-based community or patient ambassador to access the community-based resources that they need. And these are also the way that the provider can encourage patients in order to connect to the community-based resources. Next slide. So how, these are the ways out the patient can access and improve the access to information and resources. On the patient side, asking clarifying questions, what do you mean by that? And for provider, continue to encourage question asking. Also, the patient can ask the social workers for resources for or referrals. Are there ref resources in the community that can help me with this? And for the providers, link the patient with the social worker that can help the patient to connect to the resources that they need. And continue to assess what is the learning style of the patients and for patients to communicate that with the providers. And always there's an option for the patient to speak to other patients and patient ambassador to learn more about the resources and commu communicate their needs. And of course, also always encourage the patients and the patients themselves, you can access the information by going to the websites such as ESRD NCC, the National Kidney Funds, and other reputable uh, websites that can really um, dispel any misinformation. Next slide, please. And there are different ways that patient themselves or the provider can really help to link the patient to the needed resources to address the social determinants of health. For example, it will be locating the local food banks, such as in the feed, feedingamerica.org websites, or like dialing 211. That is a resources that is free of charge and the trained professionals in the area can speak to the patients to, um, to access help with utility, housing, or healthcare, a variety of resources. And for mental health care resources, the patients or the provider can encourage to call or text the 988. That would be a free and confidential support for people in crisis. And of course, there are different resources that people can access using the neighborhood navigators. So these are just some of the ways that people um, can access and provider can actually encourage patient to access resources that they need. Next slide. In closing, I wanted to have this picture to illustrate that. What do the trees and plant need? If it's something that they don't have, for example, poor quality of poverty, discrimination, that can lead to poor health outcomes. But when the community have the resources, such as the quality of housing, transportation resources, access to healthcare, access to healthy food, those are the ones that can feed into, in order to have thriving plants and trees. And that is on how we can thrive as people and as community. When inequities are low and community resources are high, people can achieve their optimal health. So these are the ones that, as we talk about today, the six different social determinants of health and ways to address them. So thank you so much for, um, for listening and for responding to the poll. Thank you, Chow, for that. That was really great information. And um, Chow, please stay um, with us. We are going to hold the questions till the end. Um, we have the second part of this presentation today. We invited two social workers on from uh, DCI in Syracuse that are going to join us today to talk a little bit about how they are addressing health equities at their facility. Um, so I'm, let me introduce you to both of them. We have Amy Griffin on the line. She is our licensed master social worker that covers the in-center program with DCI in Syracuse and the Auburn Satellite Facility, both located in New York. Amy has been a social worker for a total of 28 years and has been with DCI for the past 24 years. We also have Julie Bourbon. She is also a licensed master social worker and works at the DCI University Center in Syracuse, New York. 
She covers the home program and part of the in-center facility. Julie has been a nephrology social worker for over 34 years and the past 27 years working with the ESRD patients at DCI. So welcome ladies. Hi there, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So glad you can join us today. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just kind of I'll have a casual, I uh, got some questions for them that we're gonna present and then we're gonna listen to them and we're gonna, they're gonna share with us how they, again, as I said, have worked to overcome some of the health equity barriers that they have come across in, uh, in their facility with patients. And um, so we're gonna start, I think with Amy this, this afternoon. And Amy, I'm gonna ask you that first question. How do you identify and communicate with patients that have been identified with health related social needs, you know, such as health literacy, food insecurity, housing stability, lack of transportation, or limited English proficiency. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the, the first way that oftentimes we, uh, we meaning the social workers, so we have three full-time social workers here. Um, as, like you said, we have multiple units. We have three different hemodialysis units, as well as our home dialysis program and pediatric program. So there's three of us to cover all, all the different patients. And so when we have a brand new admission coming in, oftentimes the first way that we will get information, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm still getting over a cold, uh, is from our, our nurse manager who does, uh, accepts the patient as a new admission. So she would be the first one to get any information um, in addition to medical information they're getting as far as diagnoses, uh, their, you know, the age, their, their basic demographics, oftentimes that uh, nurse manager will often know some additional information that's gonna be helpful to us as a social worker. So obviously a key thing being if they do not speak the language or if they have minimal, minimal English. Um, so after, that point so we oftentimes like i said we'll, we'll get that in just in that initial email to let us know if there are any concerns um you know and other significant things too as far as if there occasionally is an issue with with housing that there's someone being discharged from a hospital and don't even have secure housing at that point and the hospital is involved and then we would basically be uh, taking over when they become our patient um but also after that point would be the nurse manager is typically the one who does the initial assessment when the patient comes in for their intake and they will often be accompanied by a family member or spouse or an adult child. And at that point, we would either, uh, we again, meaning the social workers, would, would meet with the patient that same day after the nurse manager does the intake and if we are not here, because oftentimes, say, for example, I may be at a different unit when that intake happens, I will then connect with the person doing the intake, the nurse manager usually, and ask her if there are any immediate needs. Um, so that would be the time we would find out, for example, that they, uh, the patient may bring up that they do not have transportation to and from dialysis, and we will get involved right away that, that first day to make sure they have, oftentimes, if they are someone who has Medicaid insurance, we're able to set up a standing order for transportation to every dialysis treatment, go over that with the patient, let them know, you know who their transportation company will be, what time they will be picked up. And then of course, if, there are, um, if we, we find out that first day that they speak a different language, we would typically know that from the hospital ahead of time and have set up an interpreter for that first meeting or at least for their first dialysis treatment. Um, so, like I said, as far as the question of how do we find out about those social needs, those are things that we are in a way not we're not waiting to, you know, down the road, like say a month later, find out, oh, um, it ends up that they they are not able to read or they have some issues at home or they're not able to afford their rent. We, we actively seek out that information. So in the very beginning, um, it's you know proactive that you're, you're looking into those things to find out what barriers there are that can impact their healthcare and their ability to get to dialysis, their ability to do their treatments 
their ability to take medications that they need. So those are things that we're asking specific questions and looking into to find out what their needs are that their social worker can assist them with to help them adhere to their to their health care. Okay. Great. Um, how about what role does the dietitian play in this? Mm -hmm. So uh, same thing that anytime there's, a, so if there is a, a concern that comes up, so not even when it's a new patient, but obviously it's an ongoing assessment of what the patient's needs are. And we all as a team, uh, team meaning the nursing, social work, dietitian, physician, all communicate via email because many of us cover different units, different satellite units. And so we all communicate. And so if we have, for example, the uh, a patient may often say something to staff people, nurses that are right on the treatment floor, and they will relay that to us. And so if, if a patient says, I, I'm low, I don't have uh, food stamps yet, I'm lo low on food or I'm out of food, then typically the social worker would, but the, the charge nurse certainly could as well. We'll let the dietitian know of a concern like that. And um, there are they are able to connect them with, with food banks. Um, there are food pantries. We actually even have uh, websites we can go to, uh, printouts to give people that show where food pantries are based on address and based on their location. And some actually even deliver um, so just, you know, connecting, finding out what the needs are, connecting the right, the right staff person to it and, and uh, doing our best to assist uh, the patient with, with those needs. Right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Sounds like you have a really good system down. So, um, so I'm going to yes, move on to the... Communication is definitely key between the it, whole team. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, I'm going to go on to the other one. It's a little more, I think I have a little more meat to it. And I know um, you probably have a lot to share in regard to this question. So can you please describe how your facility provides language appropriate educational resources or training to help patients make informed decisions? For example, what do you do differently for patients with low literacy, health literacy, or limited English proficiency? Mm -hmm. um, as far as low literacy, um, I, I have always been uh, told or, or trained that you, you, you go by uh, what, what is considered like, you know, a, maybe a, a national average of, you, you kind of make the assumption that in general, the population here, uh, in English speaking, I'm referring to, would be at a, a third or fourth grade reading level. So basically any patient education handouts are, are written based on that. So that things are, are very straightforward, um, take out any um, real medical terminology or any, anything complicated um, uh, so that it, it doesn't have to be changed uh, based on uh, each patient. But certainly um, we are, are asking patients and looking into literacy in the beginning and if we have patients that are at an even lower or unable to read, um, a lot of handouts are done using using pictures, um, and that is helpful for everyone. Um, oftentimes, you you will get um, more interest in in handouts. You know, they're colorful and have pictures as far as educating patients on things such as taking their medications or on their their renal diet. Um, and as far as the uh, limited English profic proficiency, we um, very regularly use uh, translators. We um, really varies depending on the patient and depending on the need, but that we will use all different kinds. So we will use translators in person, uh, have interpreters come in, schedule that, schedule even at a time where uh, even a spouse or a family member can also come in so they can be a part of it. And typically that would, um, a good average would be maybe an hour that we would have the translator be here so that each member of the team can meet with a patient to educate them, to go over things that they need to assess. Um, oftentimes we even do that together. So even though each member of the team might have a little bit different things that they're assessing, we still, stay as a group because we're each learning things um, 
as we're as we're talking with the help of interpreters. And then when we have a uh, less of a need, so it's it's not maybe a, a full assessment or time for a full care plan for a patient, we just have a few things we need to ask them. We can use the translator phone line. Um, we have cordless phones available here, so we will call the interpreter service over the phone and then connect to the other cordless phone, then go out to the patient who's having their dialysis treatment, hand them the cordless phone, and then I would be on the other cordless phone and talk with the patient with the interpreter right then. So right during their treatment rather than waiting um, and be able to certainly, and then at, at the end of um, what our discussion is about, then ask them if they have any other questions, concerns, while we have the interpreter on the line. Um, also, oftentimes patients will feel more comfortable with someone that they know, and that's okay too. Um, they may, uh, I may have a patient who I say hi to them while I'm out there doing this, and they may say, I, um, I wanna call um, a caseworker of mine or my sister, um, and they will get them right on their phone and just hand me their phone, uh, speak to them and go back and forth that way. Um, which is fine as long as that's the patient's decision. And we also have a phone service where we are able to call the patients at home and talk with them, uh, call the interpreter service first, uh, give them the patient's name and phone number and what language, and then they will call them. And uh, we're able to do that. Uh, also, there's times where it may be a quick question where I will just use Google Translate. That's very helpful. Um, use that with, um, you know, resources, of course, are very easy to come by when it's Spanish, but we have patients who speak Nepali, who speak Arabic, um, and I've been able to use Google Translate even when I have a quick question, or maybe it's something about, I wanna tell them about transportation. Um, I will uh, type that out, print it out, bring it right out to the patient, um, and, you know, they using visual cues, you know, they will not nod their head saying that that they understand what what I'm showing them. Um, so there's just multiple multiple ways. Um, but like we said before, a big part of that is the teamwork and everyone working together, um, scheduling these meetings ahead of time where we, we can all meet uh, with the patient who does not speak English or a very English. Um, and like I said before, also we very much communicate via email so that everyone is aware uh, so that one you know one person for example became aware of some issues with a patient we will email that so the whole team is then aware uh, we, we actually have a, a, a patient on dialysis who is uh, deaf as well as does not speak any English so we had to we've involved a um, uh, an agency in the community that works with deaf people and had an interpreter come from there as well as an interpreter who is deaf herself and speaks Nepali. So we have to have two interpreters whenever we have them come in to meet with this patient because one has to sign with him who knows Nepali and she also knows American Sign Language. So she signs to that person and she is then the one who interprets to us. Uh, uh -huh. So it can be difficult, but um, we make it work. Yeah, I mean, you definitely um, have really gone, you know, you're thinking out of the box. I mean, you really have multiple ways to, you know, help with these patients who are either, you know, limited English or, you know, uh, low proficiency in reading or non-English speaking. Truly, your your team, and I know it's not you, but you know you, your team, and everybody at that facility is really goes above and beyond. And some of these ideas were just are, are so. I mean, it's you know you think just using Google Translate, we all have it on our phones anymore and on our you know iPads, but to you know to actually implement that and use that, what a great idea! And uh, uh, what a barrier that you had with the patient was deaf and uh, non-English speaking, but yet it managed to overcome that barrier. So great examples. Um, and a good example with him as well is back when he was first on dialysis, he had expressed that he had no interest at all in looking into kidney transplant. He was not interested, did not want any part of having uh, another person's organ in his body. 
And so rather than just expecting that that would be his wishes all along, I brought the topic up again when we had the interpreters here with us and he had changed his mind and was interested. So we, he's now going to be referred for, uh, for a transplant evaluation. Um, so that's a, you know, a good example of yeah. communicating with exactly. someone. Otherwise, we've awesome. never been able to tell someone that. Right, that's awesome. Well, I'm going to move to Julie. I have a qu couple questions for her too. And we want to um, uh, have Julie a little time to respond. And Julie, can you give me uh, some examples of how your facility has been able to address health equity barriers related to home training or transportation? Hey, thanks, Stephanie, for having Amy and I. Uh, and I work in home dialysis. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I work in home dialysis, as you mentioned, and we love home dialysis. We feel mm -hmm. uh, any patient is a candidate for home dialysis. Uh, we are very fortunate to have a really great team, including our physician, who is just terrific. Um, and we really see barriers as challenges. Um, so we work with a great, uh, we do, a, we also meet every month as a team and we problem solve and uh, we just respect each other's opinion and we work together to look out, to look at these barriers to really have a goal of patients being successful on home dialysis. We have a great machine with Baxter, the Omnia, Omnia and that um, for, so for, for people who can't read or who are visually impaired, uh, it's a great machine with graphics and videos and voice guidance. Um, if they need to repeat something, they just push a button to repeat it um, verbally. It's it's a really friendly machine for people who are, for anybody, but especially folks who visually cannot see um, or people who can't read. We definitely include family members and friends and anyone who's invested in the patient to train with them. Um, obviously, people who have support do usually better on home dialysis. Um, we definitely use medical interpreters. We prefer not to use family for training. It's a very complex, can be complex a medical um, to go through each step of the training. And um, sometimes families bring their own bias when they interpret. So, so we really uh, use medical interpreters for the training process and that helps with uh, certainly language barriers. Um, and uh, my mileage reimbursement, a lot of Patients don't realize they can get mileage reimbursement through DSS Medicaid. So folks who live far away, we have a lot of people who live far away on home dialysis. Um, we submit for mileage reimbursement uh, if they have Medicaid or some crisis funding. So there are potentially a lot of barriers for home dialysis, but we feel that age and education um, should not impact on their ability to be successful. Um, and again, I can't stress enough about a team effort of uh, working together to problem solve and, and meet regularly like we do and communicate, which um, is so critical in, in our field. Um, I think we really do a great job with um, with the home dialysis program because we want people to be successful on home dialysis. It's a really a great option uh, for, for dialysis and uh, I love it. <laughs> and our team mm -hmm. loves working with home dialysis. Julie, I know you shared with me at one time you had a patient that had some from neuropathy in their hands. Can you, can you share with us how you were able to overcome yeah, that? Barrier? I think, um, uh, yeah, we used um, like the tips of their fingers to do some connections. We have them practice with the, there's an apron rather than practice on their own self to avoid contamination. Um, having their partner do the connections as opposed to the patient. Obviously, we want to minimize contamination and a chance of, of infection. So um, using a gripper pad, sometimes I think they use. Uh, the nurses are very creative about coming up with good ideas um, with things like that. So um, that's pretty much what I know as far as that um, connect, connecting and neuropathy. We've got okay. great nurses and a great team to really um, problem solve. And that's so helpful uh, to, to want to have people be successful on home dialysis. All right, absolutely. Okay, let me go on to the next question. Can you please describe one best practice that you believe has contributed to your facility meeting the health equity needs of patients? Well, Amy touched on it. It's it's communication, and I've been doing this so long. I, it's so critical to have a great team who communicates and respects each other's expertise. Um, we're very lucky to have a great team. The physicians are very respectful of social workers and, and, and everybody. Um, emailing and the charge nurses do reports in an email at the end of the day about patient issues. 
Um, we used to do huddles pre COVID. I'm going to get back to doing huddles meeting um, off the treatment floor just to discuss who's in the hospital and problem patients that we need to come up with some solutions of how to best deal with perhaps some challenges. Um, that's a great way to really enhance communication with the team. Not everyone has email. Uh, I think uh, I think everyone does ha have email at this point. Um, I think some PCTs, um, I don't know how often they read their email, but I think everyone now has email. So that's a great way to communicate with email for the, for the entire team, not just the nurses and uh, dietitians and doctors and, and social workers. Um, but we found the huddles were, huddles were very helpful. Um, we're gonna get back to that. Um, but also communicating with transplant teams and home care teams and in case mm -hmm. managers with the hospital about discharge planning, really coordinating services. Um, we social workers try to connect with the home care team pretty routinely, uh, see if there's safety concerns in the home, coordinate about medications. So often we have nurses call us saying, you know, the patient doesn't have the meds or there's a lot of confusion. Um, we really coordinate um, with the home care team, the hospital team, vascular, primary care physicians. Um, I just had a kid on dialysis who um, we needed a primary care to write a letter for the school um, because he was really struggling in school and worked with the nurses with the primary care and, and it all got worked out. The physician was very gracious. Um, so I got the letter, sent it to the school. Um, so just to really promote good relationships with the primary cares and vascular and transplant, it's just really important and to communicate. Um, I th think we do that very well. Um, also QAPI, quality management, our team meets obviously regularly. Um, again, to problem solve and communicate and look to how we can best improve the quality. So I really think um, we're very fortunate to um, to really communicate a lot of email, but also verbally, you know, I'll page to visit physicians if I have to uh, really connect with them and they're very good about calling back. Um, I can't stress it enough how important it is really to, to uh, promote communication to problem solve and, and really do the best we can for the patients. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Communication. We're, we're very lucky. We have a great team. The physicians are so, so good. Um, our whole team is terrific. So very lucky. Oh, well, kind of one last question. This could be for both of you, but I'll start with you, Julie, if you want to. Um, mm -hmm. How have you utilized community resources to help the patients with the social needs or, or mm -hmm. what and what are these community resources? You know, there's so many resources in the community and um, I, I know Amy will agree with me. It, it really starts with a good assessment from the social worker. Um, Amy and I have been doing this. We've been together a long time. We've, we've, we've been doing this a long time. We love the dialysis field. There's so many um, factors that factor into their um, adjustment to dialysis, their compliancy. Um, we want to empower patients to, you know, make good choices and be independent, but we also want to advocate for them and help them. Uh, and there's a lot of resources that can really help patients um, in so many home care re referrals we can make, case management, um, social daycare, medical daycare, vocational rehab. Um, Office of the Aging, uh, even insurance navigators when people struggle with insurance. There's a lot more insurance issues now with managed care plans. Uh, Catholic Charities, you know, and then you have mental health and psych psychiatric services, substance abuse, housing, adult and family. Um, I do the kids on dialysis, so school visits um, and just making referrals even for case, case management and some school resources. Um, we even had a, a patient years ago who uh, we referred to an aqua program for aqua therapy in a pool and needed to have an MD order, but um, there's just a lot of resources and it really helps folks to, um, we want them to be, we, we have the same goal as every dialysis unit. We want our patients to be independent and have a normal, active, good quality life lifestyle. So, you know, mm -hmm. any resources that we can help them tap into and motivate them to follow up, you know, that's what we want. We really want to encourage them and, and empower them. Um, and when community resources help, that's that's what we do as social workers and as our team, so. Um, Amy, did you have anything to add to that resources? Oh, she kind of touched on everything. I think the only thing to add would be just because transportation is such a huge uh, issue is that, a lot of our patients do have insurance uh, through Medicaid, so they are able to get transportation to and from. Uh, and the ones that aren't, we really um, do spend a lot of time troubleshooting with them and connecting to other community resources uh, as far as services that they may be um, eligible for based on their disability and the fact that they're on dialysis um, to be able to use um, services that are through the public bus system but that are geared towards someone with a disability that will go, you know, door to door, mm -hmm. uh, helping them with the, with those applications, um, th things like that, that 
um, may seem like common sense to us because we've been doing it for so long. Uh -huh. But uh, there are things that other people don't don't realize that uh -huh. um, they really do uh, spend a lot of time helping to connect patients with the things that are basic, you know, that get just just getting here. Uh -huh. Yep. And we have a lot of crisis management. We do a lot of. Um, we have a very at-risk population, it seems, and uh, crisis management management is very something we do almost every day. So we try to tap yeah. them into resources too for emergency housing and um, even psychiatric stuff. That we have a lot of folks who really suffer and struggle. So as social workers, we of course are advocating and, and trying to tap into these resources in the community. Um, so yeah, we we enjoy what we do for sure. Well, it's clear in your communication here today, and mm. I know we we both you know had a some time to spend uh, previously. And that's why, you know, we, we've asked you here today to share your story because of just all the good work you're doing. Um, there is a couple questions and a comment in the chat I want to get to. I know our time is getting near the end. So I want to make sure if anybody has any comments or questions, please put them in there. I see a few things I want to uh, ask to either one of you. Uh, one of it is how do you navigate obtaining written materials in other languages? I only can find resources either in English and Spanish. Uh, yeah, um, I know our company has offers some different languages, but not a lot. Mandarin, I think, and Amy, I don't know if you, um, Arabic, um, but yeah, we don't have our yeah, company. Sometimes it's not so much the educational. I think there might be some forms um, or surveys that may be available in different languages, but yeah, it's, it's so challenging when you have, materials. yeah, and as Amy said, we definitely have a bunch of folks who speak different languages. One language is so obscure that I can sometimes not even get an interpreter when I call. So it is a challenge to provide them with with something in their own language, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. But we try to be sensitive and make sure that we definitely um, in, spend as much time as we can educating them um, with their translator um, when we can't give them met, uh, written information. Got you. Right. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Uh, this is more of a comment from Holly, but she says we are independent and our hospital has been wonderful with helping assist patients financially, uh, i.e. rent, food, transportation. So thank you, Holly. I'm glad to hear that, you know, that your hospital has been a support and a resource for those patients. That's, that's good to hear. So a chow, I was wondering if you had any questions for Julie or Amy, since you you know, been listening, I know, and is uh, certainly our social scientist here. I think uh, one of the things that um, Julie and Amy talk about uh, into addressing transportation, uh, patient needing that, are there uh, other examples of a uh, patient may be able to um, get help with the different funds, um, other things that may be able to, I know that transportation is pretty uh, a tailored thing for each patient. Yeah, transportation can still be challenging for sure. Um, and funding is not as um, pl plentiful as it was years ago. Um, I know that obviously there's some funding with the National Kidney Fund, um, American Kidney Foundation. Oh, I switched that around. But um, funding is tough. Um, we used to be able to provide some funding on our, with the, through our company that we can no longer do that. Um, so we try to get creative, certainly with, you know, call a bus and office of the aging and, um, Sometimes people hire someone, they'll put an ad in hiring someone um, to help drive their car. But transportation, we don't want folks driving necessarily, but some patients feel very adamant about driving themselves. Um, so that's always a little bit of a balance to encouraging them to be independent, but yet not take risk of their safety and other people's safety. Um, but transportation can be very challenging. We have folks who live far away too. Um, I don't know if Amy has anything else to add, but... I know the funding is not as is, is, is plentiful. I don't know if this, if you, uh, Julie or Amy, have experienced this, but I'm going to just share with you what Heather put in. It says, how do you appropriately and sensitive, sensitively respond to patients who are not interested in a traditional transplant, but are rather interested in buying a kidney oh. for some, especially from other countries or whose, or whose families are? This is not totally accepted at very least fairly normalized in society. It had happened to her recently and it was a very wow. difficult conversation. And that's I, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's never come up with me. Um, 
or if it has, I, I mean, it's illegal is what I, maybe it's come up once or twice, but not in a very long, uh, lengthy conversation. It's illegal is what I would say. You do have to be sensitive, but I've never really had someone have a serious conversation yeah. about that. Yeah, same, same thing. I've had people make comments about it. Yeah. You know, that they're aware maybe that exists, but yes, yeah. I would say the same thing back that that's not something we, we would have any part in uh, assisting with or yeah. helping to communicate with anyone. Yeah. Um, and that if they have further questions, they can talk with their physician. Yeah. Um, I've had patients yeah. maybe joke about it, but I've never had a really yeah. serious conversation saying, I really yeah. want to look into this. Um, and I would be sensitive, but it's clearly illegal, um, at least yeah. in the U.S. <laughs> in the U.S., yeah. Yeah, well, it is, you know, that is, I'm sure that has come up. It sounds like Nadine has had, she says it's happened to her earlier. Yeah, that's interesting. It does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, just a more of a comment. Uh, the biggest issue I have in rural area is not getting the insurance to pay for transportation, but lack of available providers. I can mm. typically find a paying source, but often there is no one in that area to do uh, to go to do it. So that, that's um, another barrier in there. And I just had that happen with my child on dialysis the other day. Uh, the cab broke down. She lives way far away. I called Medicaid. And they said so and so was available. Then I called the cab, and they're like, "We're not going to go all the way down there." Um, so I really had to talk about advocating. I really had to say, "Listen, this is a kid, who, uh, fifteen year old, no parent with her. Uh, I got to get her home." Um, I had to call a bunch of different cabs. No one was willing to do it. Um, and I finally just really kept at it, and finally got her a ride home because it was it was so far away, and no one was had the resources to get down there, um, or they weren't willing. Um, so again, it goes a lot a lot to say about being an advocate and really, really, especially with kids, you really, really have to advocate and uh, and get the job done. Yeah. Okay, well, I think, um, Chow, is there anything you wanted to add or just um, we're, we're going to wrap up here in just about a minute? So any last uh, things you'd like to add? I think um, it's uh, one thing I think noticing from Julie and Amy is just that it's also a team effort, as we've been hearing about that uh, sometimes it's the social worker getting the information, but a lot of time is also the different um, staff at the clinic are noticing and bringing up to the social worker. So it's definitely a team effort. And um, yeah. Yeah, right. Well, I, um, Jerome, can you go on to the next slide? Sure. And just um, well, questions. Well, we've been to, and, well, but again, I really want to thank Chow uh, for being here today for the presentation. Julie and Amy for being here to take some questions for um, from me and share what you both are doing in your facilities, um, the great work you're doing to help with these patients overcome some of their health equity barriers. Um, you know, I hope everybody got was was informative and, and take could take away with something that maybe they can utilize if you're a provider within your facility uh, and think about you know instituting uh, within your organization so again thank you very much uh, I'm going to turn it uh, back over to you Jerome and to wrap us up and uh, kind of close this out for the day sure sure so uh, thank you everyone again um, I just, uh, or Stephanie just put the continue education units uh, up on the screen. You can use your cell phone to uh, connect using your cell phone's camera, or you can click on the link that was just added to uh, the WebEx chat. So uh, either way, either way, um, you will be able to connect with um, the CEU for this session. Uh, if you have trouble uh, connecting, please send an email to nccinfo.hsag. That's nccinfo at uh, hsag. Uh, uh, and uh, someone will be able to uh, help you out there. Uh, I want to uh, thank you, Stephanie, all of our, our speakers, uh, our, uh, our partners at CMS, the ESRD networks, our patient SMEs for two great days of very, uh, I think, powerful and informal, informative uh, sessions. I hope you all got something out of it, either uh, something that you can take back to your facility and implement uh, as a new practice to uh, to continue to provide the best care possible to our patients or uh, to our patients who are um, 
you know, just looking for additional information to help improve their quality of life. So uh, with that, uh, thank you on behalf of the ESRD NCC and the ESC, ESRD N NPFE LAN. Um, that's it. Uh, we enjoyed speaking with you, working with you. And uh, again, if you have any additional questions or concerns, you can always email us at nccinfo uh, dot, uh, at hsag.com. Thank you, everybody.